Show starts in two minutes. Your attention, please. Come on, Rick. You got this. You got this. They're just kids. You're a youth worker. Hey, what's up? No, 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 no. Hey, Holmes? No, no, that's dumb. That's dumb. Come on. You are the tiger. You are the tiger. Oh, I am not the tiger. As I drive through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And go on without me. Okay, let's do this. Dude, you okay? All right, Jen, I got a question for you. First time that you were put into a relationship with a young person, how did it go? I went a lot on instinct and adrenaline, but overall, wasn't really meaningful. <laughs> Not so good. Well, the thing is, all of you are starting out into a new relationship with young people. And it's hard, and we know that. And what we're going to do right now is give you a few ideas about how you can make that relationship successful. How you can love well in the middle of the relationship that you're about to step into. Empathy. The purpose of empathy is to fully understand what it must feel like to stand in another person's shoes. A lot of young people really don't like the shoes they're standing in during adolescence. It's a rough time. But through empathy, we can say to them, I want to know what it's like to be you. I care enough to figure out what it's like to be you. With empathy, what we try to do is we get perspective on the situation that makes sense to them. A lot of young people don't think that there's any adults who want to see it from their perspective. So empathy gives you that chance to say you matter. And how you feel about this, it matters to me. Empathy comes after asking some good questions, after giving some good invitations, and after listening to what they have to say. And many times, once you step into their world and see it from their perspective, they just might say, what do you think? What's your perspective on this? So often, life gives us the expectation that we need to act or look or sound a certain way in order to fit in and be accepted. Probably the hardest thing you will do in your time as a volunteer in youth ministry is to have patience with the kid who looks weird, who has that strange hair, who's covered in tattoos or piercings that you're not sure you agree with, or maybe just listens to that music that makes your head hurt. If we can look beyond the way that our students look and see their hearts, we'll begin to see them through the eyes of Jesus. We'll understand that what's on the outside has probably very little to do with what's on the inside. And when we can look inside, it becomes so much easier to accept them, to care for them, and to love them. Patience. When things have been going wrong for a lot of years in a kid's life, it's gonna take more than a few months for them to correct themselves. Remember, you might not even get a chance to reap what you have sown into this child's life. Be prepared to deal with your own disappointment and even heartbreak at the choices that young people will make. And resist the urge to try to make them to fulfill your expectations of them so that you can feel successful. Remember the incredible patience that our God has with us and demonstrate that patience by walking with the long haul through the good and the bad, through the choices that they make that you agree with and the ones that they don't. Giving advice. But what about giving advice? Well, caution people, hold on, yellow flag, flag on the play. You need to know that giving advice is something we probably shouldn't do. If you're a teenager, you've probably had entirely too much advice given to you by your friends, by your parents, by your teachers, by strangers you don't even know. They're up to their ears in advice and probably can't sort out the good from the bad. We can listen to them. We can nudge them in a certain direction. We can, when asked, give them a reflection of what we see in their lives, but advice is probably the last thing that they need from us. Even if it is the right answer, said at the wrong time, it's probably not going to reach their ears. Continue to be that friend that loves them and cares for them, but hold on the advice. Being an adult friend. Okay, so you heard this great joke and you know that your kids are gonna think it's just hilarious and it's exactly the kind of thing that they and their friends are telling each other all the time. You're gonna be the guy. Hold on. Our job is not just to be a friend to the kids, it's to be an adult friend. What does that look like? That means that you care about them, that you have fun with them, but you also show them what it means to look like a healthy grown-up. 
Some of these kids don't have a lot of people in their lives demonstrating what it looks like to be a healthy grown-up, and that's an amazing job that you get to step into. Be their friend, but give them someone to follow as well, someone that they can look at. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, imitate me. Do you have the guts to do that with your kids, to invite them to follow you, be their role model, be an adult, and be their friend? We've given you lots of insights, but now we want to give you some really practical tips on how to get to know those youth. For that, watch this next video. A lot of us really want to get to know young people, but it's hard sometimes to know where to start. My friend Kim had this amazing ability to know people quickly. She'd come home from work and she'd ride the bus home and she'd always come home saying, you just wouldn't believe the person I met on the bus today. And she'd go on to tell these fascinating stories about these strangers who had opened up to her in a bus ride. Day after day she said this and finally I said to her, Kim, do you ever wonder why you always get to sit next to the most fascinating person on the bus? And she said, I'm just lucky, I guess. I don't think it's luck. I think it's Kim being able to ask really great questions. And something that we need to learn with teenagers is not to interrogate, not to uh, interview, not to quiz them, but to be able to actually engage in finding the treasure, the treasure that God sees them as. So it's a treasure hunt. That's what it's about. So let me give you some ideas for treasure hunting. Here's the first one. It has to start somewhere. So my idea for you is to start in four places. Ask some questions, number one, about family. That's F. I'm going to give you this word form, F-O-R-M. So start asking questions about family. A lot of kids don't live with their parents and it's a bit of an awkward situation because you're not really sure who these people are in their house. And that's a great place to start. So how about saying, who lives in your house with you? Tell me about that. That's a great place to start with questions. And the second place is O, occupation. For kids, that has to do with where they go every day, the things that they do that they don't necessarily choose to. And for them, that's school. Ask them about school. Ask them how they feel about school. Ask them about the things that, that actually um, you know, frustrate them about school or the places that they really feel like school fits for them. R. R stands for recreation. And recreation is the things they do that they want to do. For kids, it can look like all sorts of different things. But a great question to start with is, if you want $1,000, what would you do with it? If you had to spend it in a week, how would you spend it? That'll tell you about the kinds of things that a kid just likes to do. So those are just three places to start when you're just beginning, but the, the fourth place is M, and M is motivation. And that's where you want to go. Motivation is the stuff that pushes us and pulls us along as we go through life. And so when we're thinking about motivation, we're asking why questions. So why do you do that with your time? Why would you spend your money that way? What are their values? What are the things that kind of push them along or pull them forward in life? Those are four great questions that you can ask when you're starting to get to know a young person. Couple other things though, one of them is make sure your questions are open-ended. That means the kind of question that you can't answer with just one word. How old are you? 14. Conversation's over. But if you say something like, tell me about, and then fill in the blanks, you'll have a better chance of moving into a conversation rather than an interview. Another thing is to be sure that you're asking about what things mean to them. You're not just gathering content, but you're finding what that content means to them. So you're asking things like, well, how did that affect you? So tell me about your day at school, and they tell you a story, and then you follow that up with, how did that affect you? That's finding out about how they're interpreting life, not just what's happening to them. You know, the thing that goes around all of these is that you can ask the best questions in the world, but if you don't listen, it's not gonna make a lot of difference. So ask great questions, but listen. Let them know you're listening. You're listening to see the treasure that they are, the treasure that God sees them as. When I was about 14 or 15, uh, YFC held a community event that was just uh, a preacher and a, and, a, and a worship team and that was the night that God decided to to grip my heart and 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 really uh, use that night to warm my heart to him and where I accepted Christ the same YFC worker that was putting on that putting on that event uh, years before when I gave my heart to Christ um, years later is, is heavily involved in my life now uh, he, he's taken under his wing, me and a couple of guys, and we've walked through uh, a lot of just the real issues that we face. Through this mentorship program, 
uh, he has helped us to really grow our faith into into to really being authentic and 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 being out there in the world. If 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 I didn't have the mentor that I do have through YFC, uh, it's really hard to say where I would be. If there's one thing I could say to you, my own Youth for Christ worker, it would be uh, thank you so much for modeling what it is to live a, a, a Christ-like life. Uh, thank you so much for modeling what it is to love your family and, and to love the people around you because it has spoken volumes to my own life and, and, and it leaves me wanting to do the same. We're going to spend the next few minutes talking about child abuse, and I wish we didn't have to. But abuse in its many forms is one of the most serious problems facing our society today. A recent study showed that almost one out of every three adults in Canada has been impacted by abuse. Abused children are made to suffer at the hands of those that they should be able to trust the most, and all too often the damage lasts a lifetime. Studies show that kids who have been abused are far more likely than others to end up using drugs, being sexually exploited, attempting suicide, living on the streets, or becoming abusers themselves. So what's the definition of abuse? A non-accidental injury of mistreatment by the actions or the omissions of the child's parents or guardians or even other adult influences. Child abuse occurs with alarming frequency and in many different forms. It might be physical abuse, 
which is any intentional physical force or action that can result in injury to a child. It could also be sexual abuse, and that's the use of a child for sexual gratification. This includes sexual touching as well as non-touching abuse, such as making a child watch sexual acts or take sexual pictures of themselves or videos. It might even be the adult intentionally peeping in on a child while they're changing or in the shower. There's also emotional abuse, and that's a pattern of destructive behavior or verbal attacks by an adult. It can include rejecting or terrorizing the child. It can be ignoring isolating or exploiting or even corrupting a child. Finally, there's neglect. And what this is, is this is a failure to provide for the child's basic needs like food and clothing, adequate shelter, supervision, even medical care. What you need to know is that reporting abuse isn't an option. It's actually your legal duty. If you think that a child is being abused, you must report your suspicion or your knowledge to your supervisor so that they can walk through the appropriate steps. They'll let the agency that's responsible for protecting young people know. And you know what? You don't need to have an ironclad case against the abuser. You don't even need to know the details. The responsibility to prove allegations rests with the government ministry and with the police. Your job is just to reflect how God sees them as precious, valuable, and worth protecting. So, as a volunteer, how do you know when someone's being abused? Well, you may notice some signs of abuse or neglect in them. Some warning signs like unexplained bruises, especially on their face or their lower back or their thighs or their arms. You might notice that the bruises are even different colors that indicate that they've happened at different stages. The child or the youth might also have sexual knowledge that's just not usual for their age, or they might have language or behavior that's sexualized beyond their peers. They might lack proper hygiene or maybe proper clothing for the weather conditions. They might have kind of an inappropriate responsibility for the well-being of younger siblings. They might have comments they're making about not having eaten for a while or being locked out for days. You might find them becoming anxious or fearful after they've been outgoing and friendly for most of the time you've known them. They may have constant complaints such as stomach aches that have no medical basis. There might just be a fear of going home. Just remember that these are warning signs and they don't necessarily mean abuse is happening, but especially where one or more sign is present in a young person over time, there is a cause for concern. Second way you might know if a child is being abused is that one of their friends might hint about it. Remember, if you have heard something, you need to ask the teen about it. Ask them directly. You could even talk with their friends about doing this together so that they can express their concern and support. Abused and neglected children almost always show signs of their suffering. But with teens who've been abu in abusive relationships over time, the abuse has almost become a norm in their life. It's something they've learned to live with. And so we need to realize that just because they're coping doesn't make it any less wrong. We need to communicate the value that young people have in our eyes and in the eyes of God by showing them that abuse in any form is not okay. There's a third way you might find out about abuse and that is by the young person just telling you. Often this starts out with a question. Hey, can you keep a secret? The answer to that is I don't keep secrets that might allow my friends to be harmed because I care too much about them to let that happen. If they do choose to tell you about abuse, here are a few things to keep in mind. Number one, stay calm. If this has been happening for a while, you don't need to rush out and make something happen for them in the next five minutes. First, you need to listen. You need to stay calm, you need to listen. Use your eyes, use your ears, use your posture to show them that you're entirely there for them. Secondly, let them know that you believe them and let them know that you think they're strong because they're talking about this. Thirdly, tell them you're so sorry this has happened, that this is part of their story, but let them know this is not their fault and this doesn't define them. Fourthly, don't say that everything will be fine now. 
because it may take a lot of time before everything is ever fine again. After you've listened to their story, you do need to contact your supervisor and you need to tell them what you've heard. You need to tell the young person that you will be doing that and involve them in that process as much as possible. Often a young person will be very concerned after they have heard that you'll tell the supervisor and the supervisor will report this to the authorities. They're going to think their family's going to get blown apart. Everything is going to be just a mess. You need to let them know that the ministry responsible for the safety of children and youth, that their mandate is actually to keep families together. And that by letting them know about this, the family is actually gonna get support. They're gonna get services that might help health come back to this family unit. Let them know that children and youth are only removed from homes if there's immediate danger. Put their mind at ease. If you suspect abuse is taking place and the young person is unwilling to talk about it, one thing you can do is you can connect them to the kid's help phone at the number below. They can even stay anonymous and a trained counselor will listen and walk them through the situation. Don't let your own fear of not knowing what to say or your uncertainty about what will happen next hold you back from standing for kids who might not think that they're valuable to stand up for themselves. I grew up in a non-church going family. Through family experiences, I was very broken and I really didn't feel like there was um, any good need for me. I guess I felt more like a burden when I, if I went to go talk to my mother or something like that because I felt like she was already dealing with so much as a single mother. I always thought I was alone, like I, everyone else had the perfect family. My cousin, who is my best friend, suddenly passed away. It really took a toll on me because I never experienced death before, but it just drifted me further away from God. I never understood why, if there's a God so great, why he would put so many difficulties into our family. It took me a while to get on board with God, I guess. Um, it definitely started by going to the youth center. I had a lot of questions. I was pretty skeptical, skeptical about believing in something you couldn't see. I was never comfortable talking face to face, like I was very shy, I was very self-conscious, I didn't, I didn't ever want to stick out and I had so many questions but if we were in a group setting I would, I always had that fear that I'd just look like an idiot. And so um, I started journaling with one of the staff members and I would just have these questions and we'd just pass it back, you know, once a week or whenever I had questions and it really would just open my eyes and she'd give me Bible verses to read and I would just study on them. Eventually just getting more into the Bible, becoming more comfortable with myself and who I was with God um, made me more outgoing. It made me more comfortable for who I am and even with all my little insecurities that I still struggle with day to day, I know God's made me like who I am for a reason. People always say, you know, I'm so sorry for what you went through and um, I couldn't be more thankful for what I went through. I'm happy I did actually because God's given me this gift to be able to connect with others and uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. The encouragement of the staff and people around just having that prayer for me and all this support is definitely what kept me going. He's really uh, opened my eyes that I want to become part of youth ministry and I truly believe if the youth center wasn't there or the staff wasn't there to back me up in my faith, I would just be a lost cause. And now, on with the show. We know it's exhausting sometimes to walk with a teen who's going through some heavy things in their lives. But we want you in this for the long haul. That means that we need you to have boundaries set up in your life to make sure that you're being cared for so you can care for the teens around you. We want you to make sure that you're not spending too much time with them, that you're still spending time with your peers and being encouraged by them. We wanna make sure you're getting enough sleep. We wanna make sure that you are spending time with Jesus and having time in your own life for things that give you energy so you'll be ready to love the people around you. Make sure that you are living a balanced life if you're going to engage with the teens in your world. Youth work is about helping students transform and grow. We wanna see their lives transformed in every area. We wanna see health for them physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually and relationally. And the biggest impact that we can have as followers of Jesus Christ is to help them grow in their spiritual lives. We want these students to hear about Christ from our mouths and see it modeled in our lives because we are the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. 
Sometimes teens are dealing with really big issues. You're gonna feel in over your head. We want you to know that we understand you're not a professional counselor and there's no reason why you should tackle these things on your own. You're part of a team. There's a supervisor over you who will know more about these issues likely than you do. There's also a network of counselors and professionals who are able to deal with issues that are beyond the things that we can handle. But we need to know that if we were to refer a student to a counselor, that we're not simply passing that student off and simply ending our input into their lives. More than referring a student to another professional, we can be taking their concerns and their needs to the person of Jesus. We can pray for healing and wholeness in their lives. More than simply referring them to someone else, we can let them know that we're actually referring them through prayer to the person who can handle and care for all of their needs and have the biggest impact in their lives. We know from experience that the best way to be equipped to deal with the hurts of the students around us is to first go to Jesus ourselves. We can't do this on our own, and we know when we run on our own energies, it feels like we're carrying these kids on our back. Instead, we need to be helping them get to the foot of the cross. We need to be giving them to Jesus so that they'll get energy from Him. Spend time with Jesus first before you go out and share Him with the kids around you. Watch this next video for some practical tips on how to share Jesus with the teens around you. When Life Teams asked if I would come and share about gospel conversations, they said, just tell a story about the last time you shared the gospel with someone. I said yes, and we set a date to do the filming three days later. I went away and thought about how this was going to be impossible to practice because obviously in the three days between when they asked me to do this and when we were going to record the video, I planned on sharing the gospel with many people, many times, so it would actually be impossible to practice sharing when the last time it was that I shared the gospel because it hadn't happened yet. And maybe that's the first point that I want to make. If you have to think back days or weeks or months to the last time you shared the gospel with someone, maybe you could be doing it better. Proverbs 4 tells us that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's true, whatever your heart is full of, that's what's going to come out of your mouth. I saw a funny thing online the other day, and it said, what if you have a friend who runs marathons and you don't know it? Don't worry, they'll tell you. And I had to laugh. I'm a marathoner and I am so guilty of this. I tell people about running all the time. And this isn't just runners. Soccer people talk about soccer, parents talk about their children, car people talk about cars. Whatever our hearts are full of and excited about, we speak about. Fill your heart with the good news and it will come out of your mouth. You know, sharing the gospel doesn't have to be a three-point sermon. It can truly be a conversation. For example, just this morning, I was at a bookstore with a teenager and we were going through the kids section, we found this book. It's a Robert Munch book called Something Good. And it's a story about a father and his daughter who are at the grocery store and the daughter was being mischievous and doing bad stuff. And through a series of events, she ends up getting put on the shelf with a price tag on her forehead, $29.95. And her dad has to come and buy her back from the store. Standing there in the bookstore aisle with this teenager, after reading this book, I said, you know that you're that little girl in the story, right? And that God loves you so much that he sent his son to come and buy you back. The gospel story can be told anywhere. Now, the moral of the story isn't to go out and buy this book and share it with people. No, no, no. It's that you can use anything, anywhere, at any time to share the good news with people. Two days ago, one of my teenagers got a new tattoo. It's of a dream catcher. And she told me about how it's to keep the bad things out and only let the good things in. And I said, you know, that's exactly God's desire for you, right? I share the gospel of people with a Starbucks cup or a napkin or a t-shirt or anything around me. If you're truly filling your heart with the story, it's going to come out of your mouth using all sorts of different things all the time. Helping teens develop spiritually begins the moment that you meet them. Jesus, who's connected to you, shines through you as you connect with them. Jesus has also been a part of their story before you even knew them. And so as your story connects with Jesus in the story of these teens, you're going to be sharing his love with them. Make sure that you don't wait for the right moment to share Jesus with them. Make sure that you're sharing his love as you go every step along the way.